Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this online gathering around pedagogies of hope and how we might reimagine university spaces. I'm Anna Vaitha and I'm curator at the Museum of Domestic Design and Architecture, MODA for short, at Middlesex University. And I have put together this event together with my colleague, Rebecca Bell, who is lecturer in fashion also here at Middlesex University. So it's great to see all of you here and I will be chairing the first panel today and Rebecca will be chairing the second panel. Before I go into the details of that, just wanted to give a bit of background as to how we put this event together. Rebecca and I met about a year and a half ago as we began discussing ways of working together in teaching using the museum collections as a resource for learning with material culture. And through those conversations, as educators, our interests collided and the feeling of urgency to create spaces that might offer counter states for ourselves and for our students. So we began talking about slow pedagogy and a how to be otherwise about decolonial approaches and our position in terms of the curriculum and the museum collections, about how we could instill hope as a productive force for change and how to action this in classroom spaces. There was also the emotional weight of despair and frustration of finding time squeezed out to pause and reflect. And it was through this that we began sharing texts around pedagogy, quotes, notes, reflections, not sure where we're going, but and I'll speak for myself here, finding reciprocity in this pedagogical curiosity and in our resistance to foreclosure of the imagination and of our teaching spaces. So we wanted to open this conversation up to create a shared or perhaps multiple shared spaces with other colleagues who are similarly posing critical questions around how we practice educational work and how we can do so, if we can, within the institutional restrictions that we must operate within. In our dreams today, we would have been gathered all together in one room. We would have big sheets of paper, markers and movable chairs to invite interaction and movement through the different themes that interested us. Hope, utopias, decolonizing, feminist approaches, ontological approaches to education. Alas, COVID happened, so this hasn't been possible, but we have been able to gather perhaps a more geographically diverse set of participants here today which wouldn't have been able to attend otherwise and we're lucky to have all of you here today an audience of experts and thinkers from different parts of the world and we're very grateful that you're joining us we're also delighted to have colleagues joining from the us kimberly jenkins from ryerson university whose work has been tremendously influential in fashion education and in relation to pedagogies as a whole but we're especially grateful today to our eight presenters who have agreed to come together and share the perspectives on pedagogy and educational practice from a range of disciplinary areas, including education, philosophy of education, sociology and nursing. The conversation today, we hope, stretches the possibilities of the thinkable, if not always the possible, which we appreciate needs to be weighted against the material realities and structures that we're in. And I think a lot of papers are going to go to the heart of that matter about how we can exist within that institutional machine and still be disruptive, whether it's about moving beyond it, but taking advantage of the positions of privilege that we are in, whether it's about focusing on the what of what we do more on the how we do it, whether it's through the reform of the university by decolonizing its curriculum and its structures or by creating micro utopias within university spaces where we can be and learn with our students in non-oppressive ways. So that just sketches some of the overarching ideas that will emerge today, but also surely be contested in the discussion. I don't want to run into the valuable time of our speakers, so I'm just going to do some of the housekeeping and then we'll move on onto our presenters. As I said earlier, we will have two panels. The first will run until 2.15 with a break of 15 minutes. And then we will start again with panel two at 2.30. We are using the webinar function of Zoom, which means that you are only able to see the panelists and Rebecca and myself as moderators. During the presentations, you can use the chat function, which has a little bubble to share thoughts, resources, links. But if you have questions for the presenters, we would ask that you post these through the Q&A uh, function. We are doing this to make sure that we don't lose sight of the questions as things can get really busy in the chat and we don't want to miss anybody's questions. We will move swiftly between presentations and then have time for discussion, which will be opened up by the moderator with some responses from the presenters, and then we will open up to the floor. 
You can also raise your hand during the time to ask questions and then we can unmute you to speak or if you prefer, you can also just type on the Q&A as I said earlier. When you write questions of the Q&A, please also let us know if you would like to ask the question yourself or if you would rather that we ask it on your behalf. I should also say that we are recording this to make it available online. So if you don't want to feature in this video, please get in touch with Rebecca or myself after the event and we will remove the footage before we put anything online. So just one final thing about our ethos for this space. In the spirit of care for all those attending, every stage of our thinking and planning for this event today has been marked by our desire to create a space that honors race, gender and class identities, just as we would in our every educational, everyday educational spaces. We wish to embrace equality and spaciousness for all, and so we position this space as one that places vital importance on the perpetuation of racial inclusion and equity, intersectionality, gender and trans inclusivity. I'll now introduce our speakers for this panel. Speaking first will be Judith Suiza, who is Professor of Philosophy of Education at the Institute of Education at University College London. She is interested in the intersection between political ideas and educational practice. In particular, her concern is to challenge the narrow focus on state schooling characteristic of so much educational philosophy, theory and research, and to explore the underlying political and moral assumptions of pedagogical relationships outside the arena of institutional forms of education. And the title of her talk today is What are we critical with and what are we hopeful about? Our next speaker will be Darren Webb, who is Senior Lecturer in Education at the University of Sheffield. He is interested in hope as a human experience, in particular, how hope is constructed in and through social institutions such as education and how hope might be mobilised in the service of revolutionary politics. He's also interested in the pedagogical practices of the utopian educator. How does a committed utopist bring this commitment to bear on the role as an educator? Can there be such a thing as utopian pedagogy or utopian pedagogue? Where and how can or should utopian pedagogy best operate? And he'll develop some of this uh, in his talk, which is posed as a question, Spaces and Pedagogies of Hope in the Age of Coronavirus. Our third speaker is Carly Guest, who is a colleague here at Biddlesex University. Carly is senior lecturer in sociology and her work is concerned with the personal and intimate narratives and memories of political movements, moments and institutions. Carly utilizes creative narrative methodologies and feminist and critical pedagogies in her research and teaching practice. Her talk will explore what it means to teach on the edge of time, critical pedagogies and precarious utopias in the sociology classroom. And finally, Azuma Dennis is joining us from the Open University, where she is Senior Lecturer in Education, Leadership and Management. She has published in a wide range of peer-reviewed international journals, including Educational Management Administration and Leadership and International Journal of Lifelong Education. Her research interests centre on three areas, post-16 policy, professionalism and practice, leading and managing quality in vocational education, and teacher education, critical pedagogy, ethics, and social justice. And her talk is going to be on speculative pedagogies of hope, a decolonizing intervention. So a huge thanks to all our speakers and I'll hand over to you, Judith. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's really good to be here, although it feels odd to say it's really good to be here because um, I'm just, again, sitting in my bedroom at my desk where I've been for the past four months. <laughs> um, and that's kind of the theme of part of what I want to say. It's a bit daunting going first because I really wasn't sure what to expect. And I'm not even sure if what I'm going to talk about quite matches the title that I gave when I sent in my abstract. But anyway, I took as a sort of starting off point this theme of envisaging alternatives, which was in the, the invitation to, to today's seminar. Um, and I start from the position that the urgent political task that we face is to understand and analyze what's wrong with our current political institutions and structures and to imagine alternatives. So I see educational spaces as just some of the sites in which this kind of critical reflection and imagining can go on. So for me, it's not primarily an alternative to the university that we need to imagine, but an alternative to our political systems um, in which education takes on particular forms. So I want to focus 
in the few minutes I've got on the notion of educational responsibility and ideas about um, the social as, as part of the educational environment in which we work. Um, and I'm drawing perhaps somewhat controversially on some work by Hannah Arendt here, but also on some critics of Arendt. So I see it as part of my responsibility as an educator to introduce ideas, conceptual resources, theoretical frameworks into these pedagogical spaces that we find ourselves in so that we can think through them and draw on them in the exercise of reflecting on the world that we live in and imagining how it could be different and better. Um, and in order for this to happen, I don't think it's enough that we pay attention to the processes that go on in these spaces and the virtues that we might embody as educators, perhaps virtues associated with critical pedagogy, such as humility, openness, and so on. Um, I think we also have to think about what it is that we're talking about and how we can um, share some sort of common ground or common understanding that can be the basis for our discussions. So the way I thought of the question is if we're engaged in an emancipatory pedagogy, what is it that we're liberating our students from and what are we being critical about? And I don't think we can make sense of this question and I don't think our students can make sense of it without thinking about what Arendtian scholars call public things okay and I'll come back to this so the public things could be things like schools there could be things like the state right there could be physical spaces such as cities spaces in which we move and live um, and actually I feel that I'm generally able to do something like this educational task and to introduce critical frameworks and resources into this space with varied degrees of success, even within the most sort of neoliberal elite universities, right? So of course, there are bigger questions here about who's able to access and enter those spaces to begin with, especially given that universities now are operating within a highly unjust global market of higher education. But, but what I want to focus on at the moment is the way in which we operate in those spaces as educators and I'm particularly concerned that the move to online teaching that a lot of us are now having to deal with is undermining some of the educational and political potential of the kind of pedagogical encounters that, that I'm talking about. Now one reason for this is the very physicality of the space right and there are advocates of uh, what's called decolonizing technology, people like Peter Jandrick, who drawing on Frere and post-colonial theorists like Fanon, have theorized how various strategies of grassroots organization, resistance, things like piracy and open source software can constitute a kind of digital um, decolonization, a way of resisting the commodification of education. Um, Jandrick also talks about again, an analogy with, here with post-colonial theory, the way in which it's impossible to separate out education and information and communication technologies um, in what he calls digitally colonized societies. Right? And I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I think that in arguing that in these societies, pre-digital schools and universities are obsolete, I think perhaps these theorists are in danger of occluding the ways in which the social spaces and the communities and relationships that are made possible in these actual physical places have something educationally valuable and significant about them. And so part of the problem I think with the online world is that although on the surface it might look like some of the barriers between the public and the private for example are being broken down and we're all coming together in some supposedly sort of neutral public space in fact, this is a, a space that's devoid of political significance in many ways. It's a space that, by definition, takes us out of the actual public spaces where politics as a kind of collective process of political action goes on. And it goes on around things, public things, right, in this Arendtian sense. And these can be things that are contested, of course, but they can be also things that are valued and shared. Um, now, often critics of online learning that emphasize uh, clear and measurable outcomes defend uh, versions of constructionist uh, theories of learning. And they're often quite skeptical about the emphasis on content, um, particularly when it's framed as a kind of content that can be 
broken down and, and delivered to students and measured. Now, although I, I get the, the critique of sort of measurable outcomes, I don't think it's true that all content is co-constructed in advance of the learning. I, I, I don't actually agree with that. I think um, even though I try to make my teaching and learning as dialogical as possible, I have content that I want to bring to my students. This is what I think educational responsibility means. And I think we need to be able to create spaces where we can come together around this content and carefully examine it, critique it, explore it, challenge it, of course, and relate it to the real world in which we're living. So I'm drawing a parallel here between the claim that it's not enough to emphasize the procedural aspects of learning and the point that it's not enough to emphasize the procedural aspects of democratic politics. Um, this is a, an argument that Bonnie Honig, a contemporary political philosopher, has made, again, drawing on Arendt and Arendt's idea of politics as a pluralist sphere of action, which is always constructed around what she calls public things. Um, and it's through our shared encounter with these things that we can disclose and make sense of the world in a shared space. Now, as I said, it's somewhat counterintuitive to draw on Arendt here because of her notoriously problematic distinction um, between the social and the political and her insistence that education and schools belong in the realm of the social rather than the political, um, which is not a point that I agree with. But I do think that this idea of pedagogical responsibility and the idea that disclosing the world to pupils is part of that responsibility is something worth, worth thinking about. And Arendt, of course, is talking about children. Um, but I think this holds true to an extent for higher education. So often in the classrooms I teach in, the world that's experienced by some of my students is not the same as the world that's experienced by others. Okay, I teach with quite diverse groups of students. Um, and so the educational task then becomes not just listening and sharing people's experience, of the world that they inhabit, but also trying to make sense of and reflect on shared aspects of a common world that we're in the process of working on and, and challenging together. Um, and I don't think that students in my classroom necessarily have an understanding or shared understanding of what it is that we need to be critical of or what we're liberating people from, right? Um, they have different experiences of privilege and oppression. And although I'm I'm committed to exploring these political issues in my teaching, I feel that my primary responsibility is to offer theoretical resources in which um, facts about the world and ways of understanding the world get disclosed in this Arendtian sense. And Arendt, in her uh, discussion of facts and falsehood and her discussion of political lies, uh, makes the point that factual statements acquire political implications only by, by being put in an interpretive context. Um, and she notes that in contrast, political lies, which seems rather topical, so political lies such as rewriting history, don't need any context to be of political significance. So this is a much broader point. But what I want to focus on here is this idea of interpretive context that makes sense of um, truth and falsehood. Often these interpretive contexts are not things that can be easily or quickly understood. They certainly require time. They're not things that can be kind of broken down in an online learning course or uh, to use a verb that I encountered for the first time a couple of weeks ago in a training course for online teaching, chunked. I don't think these things could be easily chunked. I didn't even know that was a verb, but never mind. Um, so I, I think that we have to this notion of the interpretive context is, is an interesting one. And I think that sometimes the significance of the interpretive context and the content that we're sharing becomes tangible in the public spaces in which we encounter one another. Um, so yeah, although, as I said, I share the criticism of many scholars who've uh, challenged Aaron's distinction between the political and the social. I do think we can draw on an, an expanded concept of the political that involves what Hannah Pitkin calls the transformation of social conditions into political conditions of need and interest into principle and justice, right? And on this view, the problem for our political life is not as Aaron 
letting the social question in, but of failing to transform it in political activity. Sorry, are you signalling that I have to wrap yeah, sorry, up? Sorry, just yeah. as, yeah, wrap, if you could wrap up. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I've just yeah, got yeah. like another minute. Okay, so another theorist that, that um, is critical of Arendt is, but draws on her work, interestingly, I think, is Banu Bargu, who um, articulates a, a view of commensality, this idea of an everyday practice that she connects with the wider practice of commoning, a practice that can be subversive by challenging social orders built on hierarchies and exploitation. Um, but th she also sees as something that's disappeared from our political life, along with the process of land enclosures and, and the, the development of modern capitalism, the enclosure of the commons. Um, and I think it's difficult to create practices of commensality as this act of coming together around shared things without interacting with others in a social space. And I think classrooms, even in existing institutions, can be these kind of subversive spaces in which we come together around shared objects and disclose the world. Um, and often the subversive nature of this, this kind of pedagogy is described as teaching in the cracks right, within the institutions of the capitalist state. But I feel like in the real world of the university with its classrooms and corridors and coffee shops and so on, um, it's easier to see where the cracks are, right? You can see the cracks. So even in the non-online world, we're also required to develop, you know, clear outlines for our courses and learning aims and outcomes and to put them in a handbook and so on. But it's precisely the distance between those stated aims and outcomes that might be on a piece of paper and what physically goes on in the classroom that creates one of these cracks, right, which have now become invisible. So I really want to ask, where are the cracks in, in an online course where the lecture, the seminar, the discussion all kind of distilled into the same small, smooth surface visible through a screen? Um, now, of course, you could say that in a way what the current crisis has done um, in, in demanding that we very quickly just adapt our work to carry on providing degrees and qualifications, even if we have no space to teach it, is stripped away the pretense that the university was ever anything other than um, a, a degree awarding body, right? But I think that the fact that we can't see the cracks and we can't engage with the embodied political meaning in our educational spaces, in a virtual classroom, is, <coughs> is really worrying, right? The virtual classroom diverts our attention from the physical labor done by real people who create and sustain the space of the university or the school. Um, I think the political aspects of what we're learning about are somehow more occluded in this virtual space. It deterritorializes people, it detaches them from their political environments. Um, and although the web is sometimes talked about as a space of politics, I think that what's missing from this is a concept of the social and these more expansive ideas of the social as involving values such as um, commensality that is not reflected in any kind of narrow concept of the political that I worry that we're, we're kind of reducing discussions to. So thank you. Sorry for going over a bit. I did time this yesterday and it was 10 minutes. <laughs> Thanks very much, Judith. I think we're, we're just going to move swiftly, though, because we, we don't want to run over time and then we can pick those questions. But I, again, I know there's already been some comments around this concept of commensality, and I think everything you bring about this idea of the sort of dematerialization that happens in online spaces is really going to be picked up later on. So thanks very much for that, for all those thoughts. And Darren, you are next, so I'll hand over to you. Okay. Um, running with the theme of kind of deterritorialization and disembodiment, um, critical pedagogy is in a critical condition. More than anything, the pedagogical approaches associated with Paolo Freire and bell hooks are embodied experiences. For Antonio Dada, critical pedagogy is a pedagogy of closeness, touch, intimacy, care, reciprocity, love and kinship. A relational process of being in communion, of being with, of being fully present. An organic process of bodies together coming to know and be known. A collective process of curiosity, creativity, and imagination, shot through with shared moments of tenderness, compassion, vulnerability, uncertainty, and anxiety. A dialogical process in which the materiality of bodies is indispensable, in which the vital experiences of the flesh are central to any real act of knowing. Critical pedagogy is also a pedagogy of depth, a pedagogy of long, close, collective readings, 
extended dialogue and constructions of knowledge emerging, sometimes painfully, from critical explorations, lived histories and experiences. It's a pedagogy of unfinishedness in which learners and educators hold hands as they guide each other along the ontological path towards becoming more fully themselves. It's the intimacy forged by the materiality of presence that makes possible the process of educational archaeology, the uncovering of submerged longings, the excavation of buried histories, the tapping of repressed desires, which is the key to understanding critical pedagogy as a utopian endeavour. Transgressive pedagogical spaces are characterised by bodies in alliance as individual learners forge a collective we. For Dada, one of the key aims of critical pedagogy is to diminish the distance, both the distance between teacher and learner and the distance between lived experience and what is learned. How does one embody and enact at a distance a pedagogical approach which seeks at its very core to diminish distance? This moment does seem critical because distance, isolation, separation, disconnection, atomized, abstracted, fettered bodies are all antithetical to critical pedagogy in any and all of its various forms. Of course, we are told that educational technology opens up new possibilities. And indeed, the discourse of radicalism has been recuperated by the university with gay abandon. There's countless attempts are made to persuade us that EdTech holds the key to new processes and practices that are radical, innovative, sustainable. At long last, the university has found the opportunity to deal with those malcontents who stubbornly refuse to use lecture capture as asynchronous pre-recorded materials transferable across multiple programs are heralded as radical pedagogy incarnate. Three cheers for disaster pedagogy. Kaltura gets fat as we pre-record our way our job security under the banner of radical innovation. I've written before about academic resistance and the disciplining of dissent. And I concluded then that critical, radical, utopian pedagogy within the contemporary university is nothing more than the search for bolt holes and breathing spaces in the system. Of course, we're precious about our modules, our programmes, our seminar rooms. We work hard to defend our small bunkers of relative autonomy from the onslaught of market forces and the incursion of mechanisms of surveillance and control. The pedagogical spaces we create, however, are not harbingers of a new world, but places of refuge and respite. Places we retreat to, to escape the realities of an increasingly dehumanised existence. What I didn't emphasise then, however, was the importance of breathing spaces. Finding and inhabiting these spaces is absolutely essential, simply to survive. We all need spaces in which we can breathe, in which we can live and be with people in ways we want to live and be. They're necessary for regrouping, for regaining sap strength. And while the transgressive force of the subterfuge rhythms of the undercommons always struck me as overplayed, I do miss those fugitive encounters on the streets, on the stairwells, in the corridors, in the kitchen, in passing. I feel their loss as a significant lack. What this critical moment has revealed to me is the fundamental centrality of material bodily presence to educational encounters. And this raises profound questions, of course, about how best to enable experience of full presence for all bodies, including and especially those marginalized or excluded because of color, gender, sexuality, disability or class. But it's something we should be fighting for in response to the daily messages telling us that the move to online learning presents radical opportunities. For me, there's little hope to be placed in the university as such, and certainly no reimagining of its spaces that can speak to an insurgent radical transformative hope. Leaving aside the brute disciplining force of generalized precarity, what we're witnessing now is a firm bedding in of what I term sound hope, a mode of hoping which espouses a lofty sense of possibility but is tempered by a gritty sense of limits. Living in the grips of sound hope, one finds a narrowing of the bounds of possibility in the name of a co-opted utopianism an emaciated utopian realism that tames and tempers the radicality of utopia and reduces it to localised innovations realisable in existing questions all outside what are centrally on the basis of sound robust financial modelling been deemed possible are quickly dismissed as fanciful, naive and impossible. What sees in this critical moment 
means for me is the recognition that sites of transformative hope and utopian pedagogy lie not in the university, however much one reimagines it, but in communities and movements outside and divorced from it. Recent events and movements such as Black Lives Matter and the Autonomous Zone in Seattle have shown us where the real sites for learning and practices of hope lie, and they're not within the walls of the university. Educational institutions cannot be abstracted from the social, economic and political relations within which they're embedded and of which they're expressive. Any utopian vision for education needs to be located within a wider vision of the social totality. And any struggle to reconstitute education, both imaginatively and materially, needs to be embedded within wider struggles for systemic change. While seeking to preserve our bolt holes and breathing spaces within the university, we should be bringing our privileged skills, knowledge and resources to bear in wider social movements and community struggles. As Max Haven and Alex Kastnovich note, within the imaginaries of social movements, we can talk of utopian desire and a utopian horizon, even if movement actors can't fully or completely articulate what it might look like. And there's a role for pedagogy here in convoking the radical imagination, animating, enlivening, drawing together and building on the amorphous utopian imaginings of movement members. To convoke is to call something which isn't fully present into being. And this should be seen as the collective endeavor and iterative pedagogical process. To take dreams, desires, hopes and fears and tie them together to construct a vision, a narrative, a story that resonates, that speaks to us, that motivates and guides. The very process of working together to construct a grassroots utopia can have transformative effects. Through exploring and reflecting on our ethics, motivations, desires and dreams, we get to know these better. Through sharing with each other, through sharing with each other, we can learn, refine, develop and enhance the principles that drive us. And we can gain a clearer picture of how these guide our daily practices. And it's not just the end result, a shared utopia, that's useful and important. It's the journey too the process of utopian construction as a collaborative endeavour. By working together to slowly, gradually build a grassroots utopia, we might understand this as something like a shared, reciprocal, respectful, iterative process of collective learning. So, can we build a grassroots utopia? Can we identify in our struggles, shared principles, motivations, aims, practices, dreams, hopes, fears, ethics and goals? Can we identify in our daily lives thwarted desires, suppressed longing, untapped possibilities? And can we ask what a society would look like in which these were satisfied and realised? Can we work collectively together to develop a shared vision of the kind of society we'd like to create? And can we then use this vision, this shared vision of an alternative way in being, to help mobilise and drive forward our collective struggles for systemic change? I think the answer is yes. And this is what I understand a pedagogy of transformative hope to be. End. Thank you, Darren. That's uh, also perfectly timed, even less than 10 minutes. Uh, so thanks very much for, for those thoughts. And uh, we are going to move on to Carly, who is going to keep on discussing on this theme of or this question of utopia, but actually thinking within the institution, which I think will be then interesting to think about in the discussion as to that relationship between within the university and beyond the university and what you've just been talking about. So thanks very much for, for that. Carly, um, I hand over to you. I think you, you had the presentation ready or would you like yeah. to share? No, I'm going to try sharing. It should hopefully work. Um... Oh, sorry. Okay, is that visible? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so like so many of us, I'm sure Bell Hooks has helped me to think about my pedagogy, my role and approach as a teacher, what education is for and how we can create a transformative teaching and learning community. In Teaching Community, a, ped a Pedagogy of Hope, Hooks argues that pedagogy of hope emerges from creating new ways of thinking and teaching that, quote, do not reinforce systems of domination, of imperialism, racism, sexism, of class elitism. Teachers, she suggests, enter the classroom with hope, a hope to create the conditions for transformation, for critical engagement with the world, for connection and community. 
hope is empowering in the face of forces of injustice. Knowing the institutions we work in, the reproduction of racism and white supremacy through these institutions, issues such as the great awarding gap, the microaggressions experienced by students and staff of colour, the impact of a lack of a sense of belonging and the reproduction of whiteness through the curriculum, I might hope that as a white member of staff with all the privilege that that affords, when I enter the classroom, I am able to, as Hooks emphasises, challenge rather than reinforce these systems of domination. But what hope shouldn't instill in white academics is complacency. I don't want to rely on my hope as a start and end point, but for it to be a force that propels me to think, to reflect, listen and learn, and for that to be an ongoing process. So what I'm going to talk about is how slowing down in order to think about how to teach in response to some um, moments in the classroom enabled me to do this. And I want to think about um, think about this practice and process of developing a pedagogy as, as ongoing and requiring reflection and critical engagement with my own teaching practice. So there have been a couple of moments in particular in class that stand out um, as having really prompted me to reflect on my teaching practice and that I return to and think about in relation to teaching fairly regularly. And I'm not going to explain these in detail here, but importantly, they were moments that implicitly and at times explicitly drew attention to and in one case prompted discussion of my position as a white lecturer in a class with a majority of students of colour. Thinking about my response to these moments at the time and subsequently led me to engage with the slowness movement in academia as well as return to the work of Hooks and others. Dialogue with colleagues and students has also been critical in helping me think through these moments in particular discussing the decolonizing efforts led by Rima Sani and previously Akhila Ahmet in my department at Middlesex. Work on slow scholarships and pedagogy draws on the slow food movement, which advocated for a careful, meditative, collective engagement with food. Slow scholarship and pedagogy are expressions of resistance to the neoliberal university, rethinking its temporalities and practices through an ethics of care. And inspired by this work, I wanted to find a way to slow down in order to think about how to teach. Um, studies that consider how academics develop their pedagogies are limited and have largely focused on the impact of institutional professional development programmes, which whilst being found to have a positive impact in many ways in the development of a teaching identity, um, don't always acknowledge that the development of a teaching identity and pedagogy is ongoing and, and a changing process that can't be confined to an institutional programme. So one way of doing this for me was to read outside my discipline and bring this reading into conversation with the critical pedagogies that have been so helpful to me. So as part of the MA in higher education that I'm currently studying for at Middlesex, we had the opportunity to consider how a non-pedagogical text might be useful for thinking about our pedagogy. And I decided to return to a feminist science fiction novel from 1976, Woman on the Edge of Time by Marge Piercy. The novel follows the protagonist Consuela Ramos as she travels into the future with her time traveling guide, Lucienta, where she has the power to determine the course of history with her actions leading to either a utopian or dystopian future. The novel is driven by hope, imagination, questions about what control we have over our future and the power to transform these. Crucially for teaching, I think, Deirdre Ben remarked that, quote, Piercy tried to show what a society might look like when people's characteristics and gifts are cherished rather than deplored or ignored. I took a diffractive approach to reading this novel, reading it through and with other texts, particularly Hook's teaching to transgress. This form of reading brings text into conversation using insights from one to explore the other. I read the novel with an eye for themes that might be instructive for teaching and found them and found them some explicit, some implicit. The act of reading a novel outside my discipline, often in in the office, taking the time to slow down and think about how to teach, how it might help develop my teaching, also put me at odds with the dominant temor temporalities of the marketized neoliberal university. The act of reading slowly and across genres illuminated the conditions that we're working in, but also importantly, highlighted the many privileges of my secure post. Whilst I might have felt a need to explain that I was really working by reading, in fact, reading this novel in a relatively private office as someone secure in post and with collegial and supportive colleagues carried little genuine risk. 
As Carol Lathwaite and Barbara Reed point out, the question of who can resist and how is contin contingent in, on a number of factors, including gender, race and seniority. However, a, a feeling that my reading at work might be considered unproductive, and I know how ironic that sounds, demonstrates the various ways we internalise the demands, expectations and temporalities of the contemporary university and the ways in which the audit culture of universities means that, to quote Leithwood and Reed, surveillance regimes are internalised and reenacted by participants, between participants. Reading, thinking about and discussing and writing about this novel helped me formulate and articulate my pedagogic practice as one of teaching on the edge of time. This conveys my sense of occupying different temporal positions in the classroom, which develop my teaching practice and crucially, I think, recognise and embrace the uncertainty of teaching, demanding that we ask what this uncertainty is drawing our attention to, rather than rely, relying on the overconfidence, assurance and authority that academia so often expects us to perform. So in trying to think about my temporal positioning in the classroom, particularly thinking about my response to uh, moments that I referenced earlier, I um, thought about these four different aspects. So firstly, in the classroom, we may often have a sense of not knowing, not knowing how best to respond, whether the approach we're taking is the right one. Like our protagonist in the novel, we have different options with often unknowable effects. Discussing these with students and colleagues is often the most productive way of moving beyond this sense of not knowing. Secondly, embracing uncertainty means questioning our responses and approaches. It means asking the questions that Bell Hooks poses about how we can co-create the conditions for freedom and disruption, challenge thinking and engage differently with the world. I think again this requires to be open to reflection, questioning and challenge. Thirdly, discussion in the classroom and my own positions of not knowing and uncertainty return me to my own moments of transformation through learning. We are all, always positioned on the edge of something. There is always potential to transform our thinking through learning and aspects of our engagement with the world that require transformation. I always want to remember this, particularly when students are engaging in conversations that might feel uh, challenging or, or difficult. And finally, recognising the temporal uncertainty and precarious of utopias in the classroom, those we might hope to create through a learning community. As much as we might hope that our actions in the classroom move us towards creating and at times realising transformative learning communities, we cannot assume that they will keep us there. Utopias are processes and possibilities but are always precarious and we risk complacency if we assume otherwise. So finally I just wanted to share a brief extract from my uh, teaching diary. I've been keeping reflexive teaching diaries um, on and off whilst working at Middlesex. And in recent work um, that I've been doing in another area with Rachel Schoerger at Kent, uh, we've been using eye poems, which were um, developed by Brown and Gilligan uh, to really look at um, transcripts and think about the subjective and effective dimensions of experience. So with an eye poem, you take the eye statements and, and arrange them to create a poem. So in preparation for today, I thought it might be interesting to return to my diaries and create some eye poems to see what they said about my experience of being in the classroom. What, the, what this poem demonstrates is um, Hooks's point that as teachers, we enter the classroom with hope. We have hope for ourselves and for our students, hope that we can do the job well, hope that students will turn up in this case and not get bored. But what this poem also demonstrates is how this hope is intertwined with uncertainty and hesitancy. And this is something that I value because it pushes me to question and to reflect. I hope that I'm always open to this reflection. There's one dimension of questioning the power and privilege and sense of belonging that being white in the academy can, can afford. So we were asked, I think, to, to bring a question um, for people today. So um, I hope this one makes sense. In the, in the novel, um, when Consuelo arrives in the future, she's initially shocked by what she sees and very suspicious and unsure of what is around her. Her guide asks her to, quote, wait a little, trust a little, let people open and unfold. And this is one of my favourite quotes from the novel. And I think it's really um, important for thinking about teaching. It emphasises slowness, generosity and patience. So I suppose my question is, how can we give time and space to ourselves, to our colleagues and our students to open and unfold, to create transformative learning environments, 
an environment that feels so rushed, so overloaded and so exhausting. Thank you. Um, how do I stop sharing? Sorry, there we go. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Carly, for leaving us with that question, which we will pick up after we hear Azuma's presentation. And, and I think for just bringing all of those different threads together around the temporality of being in a classroom and how hope and uncertainty uh, very much go together when we're thinking about how we operate within these spaces. So thanks. Thanks for that. I'm going to let Azuma now uh, go next. And after that, we will have a, a discussion. So Azuma, I think you had a presentation Yes, as well. Are you would you like to share it or would you like me to share it? I will try to share it if it works, then that's fine. Um, it's taken me to a funny place on my computer. It might be quicker if you share it. Okay, it's asking me to go into my privacy preferences and that sounds okay. complicated and time consuming. Yeah, that's right. Fun. Let me just do that. Okay. Oops, just one second. Okay. Uh, Is that um yeah, everything's gone. Does that work? That's brilliant. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so there it is. Thank you. Um, it's going to find one other thing on my computer. Uh, was there a second ago? Um, I think we'll go. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, I guess I will start by saying that um, the presentation is, is largely based on um, a, 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 a chapter that I wrote some time ago, though, uh, well, a couple of years ago, though obviously it, it relates to things which um, I'm thinking and feeling and considering all the time. It's not, it wasn't just a sort of a, a completely confined um, project. And um, like everybody, I start by thinking about the particular moment that we're in. Um, and um, there's a quote identified from uh, Milton Fried Friedman, um, clearly not somebody who I read extensively and quote particularly. In fact, this will probably be the only time I've ever quoted him. Um, but uh, the very useful idea that during a, a crisis or only a crisis, um, it is only through a crisis that actual or perceived um, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. Um, and when that crisis occurs, the actions, the actions which are taken depend on the ideas which are lying around. Um, so it seemed to me that this is a particularly useful uh, discussion for us to be having at the moment um, in order to allow some ideas to lie around um, at that moment where we know that we're all likely to be going through um, a period of, of quite dramatic change in each of the institutions that we're working for um, to make sure that the discussions that we are having are part of and contribute um, to that crisis driven change. Um, could I request the next slide, please? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. All right, that, that's brilliant, thank you. Um, so, um, the, the, what, what I'm presenting are a sort of a list of 10 things that I think um, constitute a, a decolonized uh, curriculum or that lead us towards one. Um, lists are always quite deceptive because they pretend to be simple and straightforward and you can tick them off and say job done. Um, and that's the kind of education environment that I think so many of us are used to uh, working within. Um, I looked at these and of course each of these items could spark other perpetual lists of things which can be done as, as well. Um, but they're, they're tentative suggestions of the ways in which um, I think it's, it's possible to think and talk about decolonizing um, a curriculum. 
um, when I wrote the chapter, which I'm, I'm basing this thinking around, um, I spent a lot of time um, leading up to this discussion and leading up to, you know, uh, who speaks and who's allowed to speak on behalf of everybody as the unmarked scholar. Um, and is that a stance that's open to all bodies, uh, which, which clearly uh, it isn't, but sometimes it's nice to have the anonymity and indeed the status of the um, un, unmarked, un, unmarked scholar. Um, and of course, you know, one of the reasons why it's difficult to occupy that stance is because the moment you begin to think about um, decolonization, um, you're confronted with a, a wave of emotion. And of course, the unmarked scholar is, you know, objective and unemotional. So really, I spent a, a, a great deal of time um, just sort of weighing up these different positions um, that it's possible to occupy, desirable to occupy, in order to um, have the discussion, let alone getting onto the substance of what this discussion uh, is actually uh, about. Um, could I have the next slide? So um, in terms of um, what I feel that the, the, the 10 um, possible suggestions are, um, I will start by establishing um, the idea that it's important to establish a space within which it's possible to speak about colonization. I, 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 I do really like the idea of the, um, the undercommons and it seemed to me to be the only possible space there was. And um, this of course is um, Stefano Hani and, and Fred Moton um, where you know, they, 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 they kind of suggest that um, the only possible relationship with the university is a criminal one. Um, and that um, we, you know, we sneak into the university to abuse its hospitality, to spite its mission, to join its refugee co colonies, gypsy encampment, to be in but not off the university, um, of, you know, and that this is a path of the subversive um, intellectual in the modern university, uh, which I think speaks to um, a very real sense that um, the explicit purpose of the university is not necessarily a decolonizing one and in having that discussion we are engaging in something which um, doesn't have um, official or appropriate uh, sanction um, but nonetheless it's, it's one that uh, clearly we, um, we think of as being important and inevitably that, that puts us on, on a crash course, a, 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 a point of um, contestation and um, uh, conflict. Um, but nonetheless, I think that if these discussions matter, uh, we need to establish that space in which to speak. Um, and I don't necessarily think of that as being a physically embodied space. I think our communications are always mediated um, in one way or another. And I think it's possible to establish those spaces in, you know, with, uh, with online digital at a distance um, spaces in mind. Um, it's a matter of when and how and where and what do we do in order to cultivate them. Um, could I move to the next slide, please? Um, so uh, within that, another thing I, I think it's important to recognize is to um, reflexively explore, explore our own implicatedness within the structures um, that we critique. Um, I'm responding there to um, work by um, uh, somebody called Elizabeth um, Ellsworth who writes about the attempt to implement a, a critical pedagogy within her own teaching in uh, a US university and she sort of complains that oh this doesn't feel empowering and, um, I, I, and I, I suppose I'm you know, responding to her by saying, well, yes, I agree with you, but when you go down and you begin to have this discussion in which you're um, compelled to uh, reflexively explore how you're implicated within these different power structures, it is not necessarily uh, a liberating or empowering experience. It's, it can be quite an uncomfortable and discomforting one. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't see that as being uh, a reason to, uh, to, to turn away from it. Um, I think there's a process of interrogating existing cultural 
uh, imperatives. Um, certainly the monopoly of European knowledges, assumptions and methodologies. Um, I really stopped short um, at this point of, of beginning to explore or if you like to perform um, that um, point, um, partly because I think there, you know, there is an entire universe or pluriverse of different ideas and cultural um, uh, imperatives, interpretations and knowledges which are available and I don't quite know how you present and work within those without it um, uh, well, without moving into some, some quite uncomfortable spaces with it. Um, for example, one of the ideas that I um, picked up um, and have worked with and continue to sort of look at at a distance is ideas around um, Ubuntu and thinking, well, just as an imagination, um, you know, what would a curriculum look like that's based on that kind of um, a philosophy? Um, but there are several such philosophies to pick up and I can't no, have no basis to for deciding well this one rather than that one um, but I do think it's important to pick up and play with an experiment um, with different ideas and different um, philosophies from different parts of the world and to see uh, you know what 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 they do how they change um, what we uh, what we were able to do um, identify those two frequently unexplored ways of being that are of most interest to you and imagine a the shape of a curriculum driven by them so yes i i, I suppose it's it's almost a, a, a flight of, of fancy there um a flight of the imagination to to work out what um you know how things would change uh, when we're allowed to um to explore and to challenge our existing assumptions um could i move to the next slide Oh, sorry. Yeah. Mm. I don't know this. Mm. Now, just to say, it's about ten minutes. So, um, if you Ooh. could wrap, just just about ten minutes. So, if you could wrap up maybe the next minute or so, Azuma. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, I, 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 I don't think the counter-diagnosis is to refuse a single authoritative voice, perspective or approach. Um, something which I think echoes what others um, have said, remain with the indeterminacy, accepting all conclusions as tentative, all settlements as temporary, including this one, and accepting, again, um, coming back to this idea that this might be something uh, uncomfortable um, to do. Um, could I go to the next slide? Um, perhaps most importantly, I think it's important to put the disciplinary founding fathers uh, of philosophy and social sciences in their place. Um, and, you know, th that, that phrase meaning all the things that it says explicitly and echoes, um, that is to acknowledge them as not universal, as not speaking for all of us, but as particular voices that come from a specific time and a specific place. And that is part of how we teach and talk about them, if indeed we teach and talk about them uh, at all. Um, and uh, I think locate unheard, silenced and trivialized voices relevant to your discipline, um, exemplify and amplify them and place them alongside the orthodox, vo vo uh, orthodox uh, established voices. And in doing so, um, that's an implicit motion um, of critique. Um, could I have the, the final slide? Um, I think there is a, a continual process of exploring and identifying the political implications of specific pedagogic approaches. Um, this may not be you know, the ultimate drivers to your pedagogy, but they are its inescapable uh, byproducts. Um, uh, and a, and a, a, a final point would be to extricate your curriculum from all power which is not constituted by free decisions made by free people. Um, and use, using the resources of our imagination, organisation, opposition and resistance in pursuance to that end, pausing um, only when it uh, is, of course, uh, accomplished. So I pause at that moment, I'll stop at that moment.
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Azuma. And also, I, I should also say that there is um, I mean, much of what you said in this presentation also that for those of you that are interested and we could share this afterwards, this is part of the chapter that you contributed to that book, Decolonize the University. So I think that sort of pulls many of those uh, threads. And I think, um, you know, we're going to have more discussions also on decolonizing the curriculum. So I think much of what you said is going to be picked up later on also in, in the afternoon. But also I think now I'd like to sort of bring these different threads that have come together, which have been all kind of converge, I think, on different ways in which how we might re reimagine the not even just the university, but the way that we practice as academics, whether it's beyond or within the university, in which that in ways that I think one of the things that has really stuck for me is this idea of the responsibility or the idea of the responsible teacher, the responsible educator and how to do that. So I am aware also that we are actually now where we would be breaking for the for, for the break. So I did have some questions that I wanted to ask you all. But we do have some questions from the attendees. So I think I'm going to give a priority to that. And then maybe, maybe there's other questions that I can bring up when we go into the final discussion at the end. So uh, there were a few questions that, OK, let me just. So first, we had a question from uh, Lee Jerome. And I don't know, Lee, if you would like to ask the question uh, yourself or if, Rebecca, are you able to unmute? Lee, because I think you're the host, or we can ask this question. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah. over to you, Lee. Um, okay, I, you caught me by surprise. I didn't really frame it as a question, but I was just um, reflecting back on the first two presentations and thinking, uh, Practically, what we've been asked to do at Middlesex is to respond very, very quickly to the minor modifications process to get in case we need to make changes to our modules. And I was thinking about that in relation to what Judith was saying about, in a way, my interpretation of it was we've lost a lot of the power of our pedagogic practices when we're together in small classrooms. Um, and so we've, we've tried to do some rapid thinking about, well, if we can't do that and we can't work with people in that collaborative way, what can we do in terms of the content so that at least we use the modules to do slightly different things and introduce slightly different perspectives. So I was just wondering, because I think all these ideas are fantastic, but to me it kind of boils down to you get two weeks to make minor modifications to your module and then you're locked into delivering it for 24 weeks next year online on Zoom and Teams. So one of the things we've explicitly done is think about introducing a wider range of authors and a wider range of interesting case studies from community practitioners. I mean, we have a fairly traditional research methods module, but we just thought all the time we're not doing practical stuff. Let's look at interesting examples and case studies that would pick up a range of kind of social and political issues that we might not have foregrounded uh, in the way that the module normally runs, runs, which is around kind of teamwork in small groups doing a project on campus. So it, it wasn't really, a, I suppose if there's a question there, it's kind of what people would recommend as kind of areas that you would like to see us moving forward on in terms of adapting modules, because otherwise we're just going to be left powering through the same old content with a very flat pedagogic format. Who would, who would like to take that question from Lee? I mean, I, I, I don't really have an answer. I think these are all really important points. Sorry, Asuma, were you, were you going to respond? Do you want to? No, you're go unmuted. ahead, please. Oh, okay. No, I, I just think the way in which you framed the question partly illustrates the problem with these generic kind of training pedagogy courses, that, that these decisions to me are quite dependent on the kind of thing that you teach and the kind of content that you teach. So in the course that you're describing, what you're saying might be really appropriate, but, you know, of, of course, that's one way we can address this, but, um, but other people might have other thoughts on it. I mean, I don't disagree with anything that, that you said, Lee, but yeah. Can I? Yes. Yeah, Akali, would you like to? Yes. I think actually there's there's a comment in chat which in the chat which sort of 
response. So Faith Dylan Lee has has um, has said we should maybe be a bit more open minded about the kinds of texts we value and share in our classroom, which I think really links to Azuma's point about um, I can't remember the the uh, word you used, but but those sort of marginalised texts and um, um, I think thinking about kind of this wide range of materials that is available and and how we can there are certain sort of restrictions I guess that have been imposed on us through this move to online teaching um, but thinking about how can we still try and center student experience um, think about all the where different voices are coming from and, and often that does start with kind of looking beyond the um, the kind of academic text that we're um, that we're kind of used to using, I suppose. And you know, there's a everyone can see the comment, I guess, about the whole wide range of sort of fictional and biographical and um, different types of text that we can use. And I think they can be really exciting starting points um, for exploring um, a whole wide range of issues. So. I don't, I, I don't know whether that sort of directly responds to Lee's point, but I guess thinking quite broadly about the materials that we use. Um, but yeah, I think this, this feeling of, of having to rush towards um, being able to say what we're teaching next year, next term and getting it all set in stone and then feeling trapped into it. I think maybe that happens um, differently in different disciplines. I don't, I mean, I, I'm hoping that I can still incorporate quite a lot of flexibility in terms of what's happening kind of week to week in in my classes that often responds to sort of conversations that we're having materials that students might bring but I know in different disciplines that's quite difficult um, when um, when there are very sort of particular things and texts that that um, are sort of embedded in the curriculum I guess I'm thinking about sort of law and psychology and and vocational um, vocational more vocational courses that where there are certain things you have to have to cover and have to respond to so yeah um sorry i'm just i'm i'm both looking at other questions that have been coming up and also listening so i, I apologies that my multitasking at the moment shall i say uh, we have, we have so a there, i think there was another question from yes yeah we have a question from ali um which i have unmuted um, if you'd like to go ahead, should be, hang on, there we go. Hi, thanks everyone uh, for the presentations. My question is, um, I'm interested in the classroom. For each of the speakers, where does the classroom begin and end? What do you consider the boundaries of the classroom? How does the space of the encounter and learning impact the kinds of exchange we enter into with students? and can expanding the classroom to the outside the other be a way of radical pedagogy? Who would like to take that question, perhaps? To start? Darren, yeah? Um, I don't think I ever really used the classroom as a phrase. I don't think I used it in presentation. I see... Um, I think I see pedagogical encounters as more in terms of social relations between um, groups of people rather than uh, in terms of a place in a bounded space. So those social relationships are always going to be porous between spaces and aren't. So, so I don't really see the classroom in terms of a um, physical walls to move beyond. I see the relationships extending beyond the interactions of the classroom and obviously some of those, some of those extended relations do take place online and through online media. Um, and I wouldn't want to come across as saying that um, there's no potential to be found in online interactions. I think I was simply saying that once you take physical presence away from those social relations, those pedagogical social relations, then they become um, significantly more empty or difficult to um, work with than, than ordinarily is the case. So yes, yeah, so, so sorry, I don't want to take too much time. 
I think if, if anyone like, would like to add anything to that, or otherwise we do have another question that we will ask before we go into the break from Faith Dylan. But before that, would anyone like to add anything to what Darren just said? Yeah, Carly, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I think I do use the term the classroom a lot. So um, that question really made me think, but I think as well as kind of expanding those boundaries and, and obviously so much of the learning that takes place for our students is outside the classroom and for us, but I, I also think it's really exciting to think about, you know, if we think about this physical space, how can we do that differently and how we've been really schooled in that idea of standing up at the front and we have our rows of, you know, desks and students in front of us, how can we really sort of disrupt that space? So I think even though absolutely kind of thinking beyond those walls and the walls of the institution is really important, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of sort of exciting stuff that we can do in that space as the group of people in the room, which, um, which I think is a, a nice way of thinking about how to kind of disrupt the power that, that circulates in those, you know, four walls in, in the institution. Thanks. Thanks very much, Carly. Well, I think we're going to move on to a question from Faith, who had a question, and I think she'd like to uh, to ask. So if you could connect, Faith, I think you should be unmuted. Actually, I think Faith is happy for you to ask this one. Oh, sorry. Okay, I didn't. Okay. Uh, so Faith says, um, uh, thank you everyone for your time and ideas and I wonder your thoughts are in terms of uh, sometimes highly political online communities such as K-pop, fairies, jugglers uh, who have been activists in um, RL politics from their online spaces so perhaps this is quite a question about cracks and spaces that do exist online but is the job of academics to do research on them and learn how and why they work so perhaps Judith this uh, links very much to what you were saying about the cracks finding those cracks and how there might be activism that is happening online but obviously anyone else who wants to respond to that as well. I'm not sure what the question is. So I think the question is about how there are, um, there are groups that are doing, that, that are, might be exploiting the cracks. I mean, I'm, I have to say I'm not familiar with these specific groups that um, Faith is talking about, um, but there are political online communities who are active and activist in sort of online politics, in online spaces. So maybe there are cracks and spaces online and we just, it, it's, a, it's a task of, of doing work to research what those are and how we can, I guess, sort of infiltrate those spaces so that we can operate differently um, within them. So that it's, um, yeah, so, so that's, um, does that, would anyone like to answer to that? I mean, I I suppose, of course, doing research about those those kinds of online spaces and seeing them as possibly subversive kind of cracks in the system is, is important. But to me, that doesn't negate the point that I was making about the realm of the social and, and the kind of need for, for actual public spaces where people come together. And I think a lot of political activity that goes on now, in fact, um, what passes for political activism uh, lacks that that kind of embodied public nature so you know signing online petitions would be a very obvious perhaps trivial example but but it's very different from from the physical act of, of you know going and taking part in a collective action being physically present with other people in in a space whether it's through you know occupying a space or or causing a kind of provocation by a physical presence in a space that, that, that normally excludes certain people. I just feel that maybe I'm just, you know, a dinosaur of a digital age and I have to sort of get over these, uh, these hang-ups of mine, but I feel like a lot of what passes for political activism is, is missing some, some essential aspect of public action. Well, with that, I wanted to also ask, because I think Azuma, well, I actually was going to ask you, Azuma, because you were talking earlier about how we might be using these um, online spaces. So is there, it seemed like you were presenting that there's other ways in which we might navigate those spaces or where maybe the role of affectivity emotion can actually be produced within that. So is yeah, that I mean, something you could, yeah. I mean, I, I suppose my response is to want to um, kind of blur 
um, what might be what might feel like quite rigid distinctions between online and offline spaces and I think that they are so interpenetrated with each other that I think to to have a clear distinction to, to my mind is not um, you know is, is doesn't reflect where we are at the moment um, I'm, I'm also inclined to um, to think that there is a kind of activism that can take place online which fine doesn't have the kind of the brute force of knocking Colston off his plinth um, but nonetheless can be actively involved in people um, creating um, you know performing particular types of communities online and they do translate into or they do become or do shape and you know have an influence on physical encounters um, so I, I, I kind of you know want to break down those um, distinctions a little bit and to suggest that um, you know what happens in one type of space isn't exclude exclusive to that space but also um, has as wider and broader uh, implications. And people organise, you know, people organise online, don't they? They form chat rooms and blogging spaces and they decide where they're going to meet or whose statue they're going to rip down next um, through these sort of online spaces. Yeah. We just had um, we just had um, Faith who asked this first question, um, saying the majority of oh I've missed it now the K-pop community buying the majority of the kind of Trump rally tickets and creating an empty arena through doing that. In terms of kind of empowering that digital versus kind of physical space. Yeah. Great. Well, I think unless I've missed anything, I, I think we're probably going to wrap up for this uh, for this panel and then we're going to take a little break and then we'll come to the second panel and we can pick up some of the, the remaining threads in in the final discussion uh, later this afternoon. So we are running about 15 minutes late. So maybe should we say 10 minute break and then we can come back at 22, 20 to 3 and we will start the second round table. But I also just want to say thanks very much to all our presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you.